What a great audience we have here tonight, and thank you for joining us from wherever you happen to be in the world watching The Huckabee Show here on TBN. Now, as you start the annual process of gathering up your financial records to get your tax returns ready to file by the deadline of April 15th, maybe it's a good time to remind you of an alternative to the massive, confusing, and impossible to navigate U.S. tax code, which is now over 70,000 pages long. Sounds like a government deal, doesn't it? <laughs> Since 2007, I've been an advocate of what's known as the fair tax. It was the result of getting some of the top economic scholars in the nation to do a little study on how we could get the revenue we need to run the government, but in a much less complicated way. The goal would also be to determine how to obtain that revenue in a way that would stimulate economic growth. The result of their study was the fair tax. In a nutshell, it would start by repealing the 16th Amendment. Now, what's that? That's what created the income tax. We'd repeal it, get rid of the income tax. By eliminating a tax on your income, it would eliminate one of the most despised agencies of government. We would get rid of the Internal Revenue Service. Gone, kaput, bye-bye. Now with that, do I have your attention? I think so. You see, with the fair tax, April 15th would be just another beautiful spring day. You wouldn't gather up those boxes full of receipts and records. There would be no withholding on your paycheck. No, you'd get your entire paycheck with nothing taken out each pay period. And you wouldn't need a CPA and a tax attorney to figure out how much you owed the government each year. See, the fair tax is basically a tax on consumption rather than a tax on productivity. Our current tax system punishes you for the income that you work for. It punishes you for the good investments that pay off. And then punishes you for saving money instead of wasting it. It even punishes you for dying by imposing the most unfair tax of all, the death tax, paid by your heirs when you die, and sometimes making it necessary for a family to sell a family farm or a business just to pay the government for the value of your assets at the time of your death. At the same time, the current tax code rewards you for making bad decisions and for losing money. Think about that. You're rewarded if you make your money in a criminal enterprise, you know, like selling drugs, prostitution, illegal gambling, or being an illegal immigrant. Because then you're working for cash off the books, not reporting it. Honest people doing honest work pay all the taxes. And dishonest people let you pay their taxes as well, because while the government takes money from your paycheck, criminals don't report income or work for a legitimate business. They don't pay a dime. Under the fair tax, everyone, and I mean everyone, would pay tax at the point of consuming something, not when they produced something. In simple terms, it's a sales tax. It's paid at the point of purchase on something that's bought and paid by the person making the purchase. Prostitutes, pimps, gamblers, illegal immigrants, and drug dealers probably aren't filing a 1040 income tax form. But you know what they do? They buy things. And then they would get to join you in paying taxes. For those who argue that a sales tax can be regressive and take a larger portion of one's income for basic necessities, than it would for wealthy people. Ah, the fair tax incorporates a prebate. It's a check sent to every American citizen each month, and it covers what would be the tax on basic necessities. It's based on whatever the poverty level is at the time. And because the prebate goes only to citizens, illegal immigrants won't benefit from it. But Americans at the low end of the income level will actually do much better than under the current tax system. In fact, every taxpayer does better. Now, it doesn't increase taxes, and to be fair, it doesn't decrease taxes on its face. What it does, it replaces taxes on what you produce to taxing what you consume. And by the way, if you want to cut your own taxes, you simply buy less, or you buy used things. 
And since the tax is collected when you buy something, there's just no need to fill that little box with the little pieces of paper and fill out the forms and send to the IRS and then wait for weeks for them to give you your money back. Yeah, because the money taken out of your check each pay period, folks, that's money that you have loaned to the government for free. Under the fair tax, you keep that money. You get it. They don't. Congress has the legislation to ditch the IRS and give us the fair tax, but here's the Here's the deal. The power to manipulate the tax code is the real power of Congress. And we've got to convince them to return that power to the people. I think the time has come to eliminate the IRS and make April 15th just another beautiful spring day. Let's tell Congress that the time is now. Well, we have a very special artist in residency this evening. Tim Gagno is an award-winning visual artist. He's a speaker and author. He creates some amazing works of art and does it in front of live audiences. He's also got a special art ministry that works directly with churches, schools, and veterans. Tonight, he's going to create an original piece of art just for us right here while we're doing the show. Would you give a big warm welcome to Tim Gagno? Tim, welcome. And we're going to be checking in on Tim's progress throughout the whole show, so keep an eye on him. He's got something very special planned for us, but that is going to come later. Right now, Keith Bilbrey is standing by. He is going to paint us a picture of who's on tonight's show. Keith, take it away. Sure thing, Governor. After the break, retired General Leroy Sisko is on a mission to help combat wounded veterans. You won't want to miss this. You're watching Huckabee. and sign up for his free newsletter and follow at Gov Mike Huckabee on X. And welcome back, everybody. Let's check in with our artist in residency tonight, Tim Gagno, whose art career really took off, I think, in the Air Force. Tim, you served our country in the Air Force. Is that right? I did, sir, very much. And so now you're uh, serving and helping a lot of veterans and teaching them art and uh, really helping to give them some therapy who have come back from combat. Yes, I work with the Patriot Art Foundation and we help veterans learn art so that they can tell their stories in a very, very beautiful way. Well, we're gonna talk to you again, but I want you to get back, get the painting, Tim. You, you got a lot to do and we have a short time to do it. So <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> get after it. Well, all of us here, we're strong supporters of our veterans, so we're excited to learn about the Military Warrior Support Foundation. They provide crucial support to our combat wounded heroes, Gold Star spouses, as well as their families. And everything included from financial mentoring to payment-free vehicles. And get this, they are closing in on providing their 1,000, 1,000 mortgage-free homes to our wounded warriors and their families a wonderful organization. Please give a big welcome to the founder and the CEO of the Military Warrior Support Foundation, retired Lieutenant General Leroy Sisko. Leroy, Thank it's great gentlemen. having you here. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. I, I have watched this organization under your leadership grow. You uh, have enlisted the work of George Strait. He has presented a lot of the homes with you at right. his concerts. But when I think about a thousand military families getting a home, that's a pretty big deal. Well, Governor, they also, the experts have told me that what we do, which includes you and everybody that helps me, that we saved over 150 lives. Mm. And I believe it, I've had them tell me, I've planned where, when, and how, but since I've been involved with y'all, 
It's not even a thought in my mind. Because you take a great load away from them. Correct. And now, I, I realize you have a lot of people, families who apply, and then there's a long kind of, it's an important process, right. but it is a process. It's not just, hey, I'd like a home, and they get it. Right. Uh, and we're going to talk to a family who's going through that, and, and you know, it may take a while. Uh, that's part of the deal, is, yeah. is to go through it. But when I think about what you're doing, what I'm amazed by is that you talk about the lives saved, because... We hear about 22 veterans a day taking right. their own lives. This gives them hope, and it gives them something tangible to say, Correct. we care. Plus, when we give a home or a car away, we mentor them. On a home, it's three years. On a car, it's one year. And we teach them how to get out of debt. Almost 98.6% <laughs> of them are completely out of debt mm. by the time they get their home in there. And they live in the home. But in, for the three years, and then we give them the keys and the deed to the home. See, that's what's beautiful. It's it's not just to giving something and saying goodbye, good luck. Right. But it's working with them to learn good financial management. Yes, sir. I, we want to introduce you to one of the applicants to the Military Warriors Program. I want you to take a look. You'll get to meet them. My name is Jacob Williams. I grew up in a home saturated uh, with Christian values. And from an early age, I understood God's love. While I'm serving in the army, I was sent to Iraq. Well, after one of these uh, missions, uh, we were on our way back. I remember I was in the front Humvee and it was my 20th birthday. And they're talking about what they're gonna do to me. We're just playing around, having a good time. And then all of a sudden, I just remember feeling this intense heat and not being able to talk and not being able to move. What had happened was uh, an, a, an improvised explosive device, an IED, uh, had gone off and I received uh, several injuries. The intensity of the explosion was so powerful. Oh God, uh, this, this is it. In my mind, I thought I was gonna die. Uh, someone else had other plans. And so I remember just passing out in the, in the chopper, waking up in Kuwait. And it was just so painful and it was traumatizing. And as I looked up, I was laying on my back and I saw my right hand extend in the air and I didn't see it. I didn't see my right hand. And it was in that moment where I knew my life was gonna be different. I could have died that day. I should have died that day. August 13th, 2007, the same day that I was granted life was the same day that I was granted re-life. He intervened. Yes, I'm scarred and, and yes, I live with the wounds of battle and I struggle every day. My story isn't so much a story of, oh my gosh, I can't believe that happened, let me pity you. But it's a story of, you know, there's so much good that's come out of my injury. And that's really what I wanna share is finding the goodness because of how good my God is, is the reason why I can keep going. Please welcome to the show retired private first class and airborne infantryman Jacob Williams and his wife Meredith. We're honored to have you guys here. What a beautiful story of your courage, your life. Top Gun Purple Heart recipient, a chest full of medals, but not the easiest way to get them. Jacob, you know, it's a miracle that you're alive that you and Meredith are building a life together. And I know that you have applied. You're one of those hundreds and hundreds of families that have applied to uh, perhaps get some assistance from the foundation that General Cisco is part of. How long does it take from the time you start the application to when you hear something definitive? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Uh, so right off the top of my head, it was pretty quick. Um, I mean, we applied and heard right away um, that we were accepted into the application process. Mm -hmm. um, and so during that process, really felt that uh, we were seen and cared for. So then there's a period after you've applied, you've been accepted to the process. Then you have to wait and find out if you're going to be one of the people selected, depending on how many funds come in. I mean, that's what it really comes down to. If there's no funds, there's no homes to provide. So you wait on that, which is out of everyone's control. Did they give you any idea of how long it may take before you hear whether or not there are funds available to help you with a home. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important for me to share this, that throughout the process, uh, we were in communication with, I mean, I remember Jason. Jason 
uh, was really integral in the process of, of communicating with us with what was happening. And, and so there's not like a definitive time that we were given, but you know, that's okay because during this process, Meredith and I have been praying for and just trusting and waiting on the Lord to, you know, um, if, this is, if this happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And so we just, we don't really care about the time. We're just like, we're gonna wait on the Lord and, and when it happens, it happens. And thank you so much for keeping us in the loop. Um, so, yeah. You know, you, you guys are a lot more patient than, than I could ever be. <laughs> Meredith, this has gotta also be tough. You, you guys are both strong believers. You believe God has given not only each other, but given you a future to serve him and to minister. That's, that's gotta be rewarding in itself. Yes, it's truly a blessing to even have, you know, Jacob as my helpmate in serving the Lord and just seeing where he leads. And um, it's just been an amazing journey. And, you know, he blessed us with two mm. baby boys and just, yeah. Keeping us awake. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they will do that for sure. Well, I, I wish I had the power just to give you the home, but I got to tell you, I'm not Oprah. <laughs> you know, I, I wish I was, but I, 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 can't, I can't give you the home. But I do have something that I, I want to present to you tonight, and I think it's probably going to bless you a little bit. You see, what I have here is this key. It's not from me, but it is from the foundation, and this represents a key to the new home that they are presenting to you tonight. <laughs> you are the recipients of the next home by the Military Warriors Support Foundation. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm not crying, you're crying. That's what this is. <laughs> they had no idea, Governor, that they were getting home tonight. No, they did not. We kept it from them. We told everyone on our staff, don't leak this out. <laughs> um, Wells Fargo is also one of the partners who helped make yeah. this happen through the General Cisco's foundation. You know, I, I would like to thank Wells Fargo. They're here tonight but they've helped us give away over 300 homes. Wonderful. Please give Wells Fargo a hand. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, Governor, you're, because of your helping us like you are, you're one of the sponsors on this home. And I've got a friend named Jimmy Little. He makes the best hunting blinds you can imagine. As we said, we've given away over 943 homes. Wow. Almost a half a billion dollars at a 5% overhead. Yeah. And that's what I'm extremely proud of. But, you know, I, I just can't say thank you enough to the people, like the people here tonight, that sponsor our heroes. How do you say thank you to all of them? You just ask them to keep giving so that wonderful families like Jacob and Meredith are going to be able to move into Amen. a brand new home at no cost to them, <laughs> to live your lives with the gratitude of American people who thank God every day that and, you were willing to go in their place. And those are real thankful tears she has. Yes, <laughs> from all of us. I'm seeing them in the audience as well. Our congratulations to Jacob and Meredith Ann Williams. We're gonna follow up with them later in the year to see how everything is going in their new home. And I hope that maybe this makes you want to donate to help to the Military Warrior Support Foundation to keep helping our wounded heroes and Gold Star families just like this. So here's how to do it. If you go to Huckabee.tv, we will connect you so you can give, and maybe you'll be a part of the next home that the general and the organization gives. Keith, I'm not sure where we can go from here. It's, it's, it's gonna be tough to follow this, but tell us what's ahead. A fact to follow. Well, truly amazing, Governor. Up next, we find news stories that fall through the cracks on In Case You Missed It. It's all next, and later, William Lee Golden is here. He brought his whole family to perform, so don't go away. Keith, that was one of the most special moments we've ever had on this show. Oh, I'm telling you, that, that was, oof. 
Loved it. Our audience, uh, I've I, literally, I've seen tears all through the audience out here. Yeah. And there were a few on the stage. I, okay. Yeah. There over were. the mic stand, too. Yeah. Now, Trace, I don't know. I don't think he wept a bit. <laughs> it was amazing. It was pretty cool, wasn't it? Was it? Yeah. Incredibly cool. I mean, it just, it, it just gives you joy to see a family be able to enjoy something like that. You bet. Well, we need to check in with our artist in residency, Tim Gangyo. Mm -hmm. Tim, doing over here? I know you're used to the pressure of painting live on stage. You do it wow. all the time in churches all over the country, and you paint during church services as part of the worship. So we're glad you're here. We're going to catch up with you in a bit, but it looks like you're getting this going pretty well. We're moving in groove, and we're making it happen. I believe you are. Have well, you seen this palette? If I didn't know better, I'd swear it was mustard and ketchup. On it, it looks like a... <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> taste very good. Trade. <laughs> yeah. Up. Yes, it does, but it's not. Don't eat any of that, Keith. Well, I paint. came close. Yeah. You ate enough lead paint as a kid. You <laughs> yeah, don't need to go true. through anymore. That's very true. And just for the record, so did I. <laughs> well, from that's why we are what we are. That's right? right. Yes. That's it. Well, from salty cars to dog urine samples, that'll get your attention. Did we're he gonna, say that? Yeah, I did. Because we're going to assault your senses with the week's weirdest news on In Case You Missed It. Well, recently we had to scramble to do a show after Nashville got nine inches of snow. So with these first few stories, we're getting our revenge by making fun of snow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Feel free to laugh at the snow. It deserves it. First up, professional sculptor Carlos Maldonado of Iowa City didn't want to make a typical boring snowman, so he created a realistic snow sculpture of a 20-foot great white shark. Wow. Boy, talk about a cold-blooded killer. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. I bet this made jaws drop. <laughs> oh! See what I did there? Uh-huh, yep. Uh -huh. Anyway, here's a tip for local uh -huh. kids. Don't put a magic silk top hat on Frosty the Snow Shark. If he were alive as he could be, you would not be. There you go. Mm, that's right. Next, you've heard of a blanket of snow? Well, someone in Colorado posted these bizarre photos to Facebook. And no, that is not a snow sculpture of a bloodhound. It's actually a blanket of snow that slid off of the car hood. Look at that. Now, what I want to know is what kind of car wax that guy uses. Yeah, I need that too. I need some. Yeah. Maybe it was Pam cooking spray. I don't know, but that was pretty strange. <laughs> and speaking of animals in the snow, in the most Canadian story of the week, Parks Canada urged drivers not to stop and let a moose lick their cars. And you say, well, that's nuts. Well, no, cars get coated with salt that's spread on the icy roads, and moose, or mooses, or... Is it Mises? What is it? I, I don't know what. Uh, moose? I think it's Moose, Mises, Mises moose. moose. Whatever. Moose? I'm an anyway, English major. I should know this. You should know this. <laughs> well, anyway, the moose loves a good salt lake. It's cool to see a moose close up, but stopping to let them lick your Lexus uh, uh, could get them struck by another car. Sounds like something Trey would do. I think I mean, so. By moose. the way, if you own an electric vehicle, you might electrocute a moose, so be very careful with that. <laughs> and then again, if you are a Canadian and you're living in a Canadian winter, your EV is probably stopped whether you like it or not. Uh, probably. All right, Joe. <laughs> in other news, the smokinggun.com brings us this Huck's criminal mastermind. A Clearwater, Florida woman was on probation, had to take a drug test, so she handed in a urine sample from her dog. No. I mean, that's something only Hunter Biden could get away with, right? <laughs> I'm wondering how yeah. she collected it. That's yeah, I, I don't want to know. <laughs> don't want to know. I guess she had no human friends who could pass a drug test. That's my guess. Anyway, she like couldn't use her cat's urine because it has a catnip habit, so that wouldn't work. <laughs> but the authorities knew something was amiss when she tested positive for Alpo toilet water and squirrels. Yeah. So you know what the judge did? He revoked her probation. He whacked her with a newspaper and rubbed her nose in it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, this segment has clearly gone to the dogs. So we're going to end this bit. But until next time, remember, we read the news. Well, after the break, Heather Johnston is a diplomatic mission to strengthen Israel-U.S. relations. Later. 
Tim Ganyos, a great special work of art you have to see to believe. It's all ahead on Huckabee. Well, I am so grateful for the hardworking volunteers at Samaritan's Purse, and also for the generous giving from people just like you. You're the ones who help the good work of Samaritan's Purse possible all through the year. Many lives have been changed inside and outside because of the faithful prayers and the gifts that you've provided year after year. I hope you'll continue to pray for Samaritan's Purse and the communities they serve. And if you haven't already, I hope you'll consider giving to Samaritan's Purse by calling them today, or you can visit their website, or we make it even easier. You can scan the QR code that you see on your screen right now. Thank you, and God bless. Well, my next guest is the founder of the U.S. Israel Education Association. It's a nonpartisan program. It advances dialogue and cooperation between senior U.S. officials and Israel. Since 2011, she's led tours throughout the nation of Israel and connected world leaders and decision makers to help promote and improve defense, security, economic prosperity, and most importantly, peace in the region. Please welcome Heather Johnston. Heather, great to have you great here. To be, great to be here. Thank you. I know you know I've been going to Israel for over 50 years, been 100 times, supposed to be there next week, can't, but was there just before Christmas. All of us who love the state of Israel are heartbroken at what has happened in this nation since October the 7th. Um, describe what has changed for Israel after this just horrific attack by the terrorist group Hamas. Yes, you know, the, the nation of Israel will never go back. You know, that notion that, um, you know, in the United States, we go on about our business here. Uh, things, you know, can change in the world and we lose interest. But I can tell you that Israel will never go back to status quo, to pushing things over to the side and waiting on, you know, some, a better day or trusting their neighbors. All those things have changed permanently. And when people talk, I think foolishly about, well, let's have a two-state solution, which means let's move the people who hate you a little closer mm -hmm. and let's give them more power, more authority and more access to killing you. Mm -hmm. To, to whom does that make sense? It makes it makes sense to to nobody, particularly the Israelis. And you know, if you were an Israeli politician today, you know, to even mention the two-state solution to the Israeli public, you would be the laughing stock, because the West Bank is 15 times larger than the Gaza Strip. So yeah. you can imagine just you know, right above the Tel Aviv airport and and all their major population centers the notion of putting a nefarious entity and agreeing to reward October 7th by giving the Palestinians a stake. You've been taking members of Congress and leaders, uh, political and otherwise, not just Democrats or Republicans, but independents, mm -hmm. but taking people so they can see firsthand. Mm -hmm. When people first go who haven't been before, what are their impressions and what are they surprised by? Well, it's a great question. And, you know, to take senior leaders of Congress who've been, in, who've been there for 10 to 15 years um, and to take them through the area called the West Bank. Yeah. You know, our U.S. State Department today does not allow policymakers to go into the Jewish communities inside the West Bank. Insane. So how are we running a peace yeah. process for the, for the world and facilitating it? And our policymakers aren't even allowed to go there. So we, we started those tours, and I think the surprising thing is to understand that there are actually 200,000 Palestinian workers that are inside working with the Israelis, inside yeah. their industrial zones, and that there's that, that element of the Palestinian society that, that wants to or are working with Israelis. You know, I've been to a place that you've spent a lot of time, Ariel, mm -hmm. and it's a place where there's some factories, mm -hmm. and Jewish people work shoulder to shoulder, with uh, Palestinian people, many of whom are Muslim, they not only work together, they get along, their families recreate together, they go to each other's homes. Mm -hmm. You know, the process of peace could be a lot easier if the politicians would quit trying to figure it out mm -hmm. and let people grow economically mm -hmm. 
and get to know each other. And that's kind of what's happened at places like RAL. It's, it's so true. And you know, I think one of the surprising things is we're taking the senior leaders and they're meeting with the Palestinian leaders, the business leaders, you know, inside the West Bank, as well as the Israelis. They're understanding that there is a grassroots movement there that really is unstoppable. And even this war ultimately isn't gonna stop it because there's a crying need in the heart of many Palestinians to normalize, to have families grow up in kindergartens that makes sense and, and, and outside of terror and, and being able to work together. And, and that's the future. And so on the heels of that, um, there is a Judea and Samaria Chamber of Commerce today with 750 businesses wow. representing Palestinians and Israelis working together, and they're going to endure this war. And, and I think it's important that our audience understand sometimes they have to go against the leadership of the Palestinian Authority mm -hmm. because President uh, Abbas is anything but friendly toward this. They want there to be divisions and enmity. They teach children to hate Jews from the time they're little kids. Teach them that to kill a Jew is a wonderful thing. So these are people who recognize that that's not sensible. Right. It's not sustainable. And they're breaking away from the leadership of their government mm -hmm. in the Palestinian Authority. But that's the real hope, isn't it? When people have good jobs, they're yes. treated fine. And, you know, they, they get to raise their families in peace. Mm -hmm. Well, it is the future. It will be the future, and it's hard to see it now. More than ever, it's so blurry and hazy for us to see how that could happen, but I can promise you that is what is ahead, is Palestinians and Israelis being able to work together. What is the greatest hope that you have as you take people over? I mean, you know, I see some people in our own Congress, and I'm shocked. They're all but supporting Hamas and their atrocities, and I, I don't even we don't, don't know how to get my head around that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, um, Governor, we, we really understand that the entire future for the United States of America really depends so much on a strong U.S.-Israel collaboration, and we can never let that fail. The, the, the heartbeat of that is our U.S. Congress. They are the stabilizing factor in even, even with all of the dysfunctions of it. They're still the stabilizing factor, the balance of power to any White House, and we, they have to be educated in order to be able to really come to the fore and lead the collaboration. We are the iconic nation on earth that is supporting Israel today. And I think a lot of Americans may say, oh, well, why do we have to care about Israel? But there is benefit to the United States with the partnership we have. And a lot of Americans don't understand how many things are cell phones, heart procedures and surgery that we would not have if it were not for Israel security measures, and so much more that we benefit from because of the technology of Israel. Absolutely. It's an economic development. It's missile defense. It's security. It's intelligence. It's everything. Israel's been um, called the aircraft carrier for the United States in the Middle East. What would happen if we lost Israel? Yeah. So it is in U.S. It's in the U.S. interest, best interest, and always will be to have a strong Israel we have a strong United States when we do so. Well, I've bumped into you in Israel before. I have a feeling we'll do it again, and I hope you'll continue the extraordinary work of taking political leaders from this country to see Israel firsthand Thank because you. they need to see it. If you want to stay up to speed on the work that the USIEA is doing and the support in Washington to keep the state of Israel safe and prosperous, you can do so, as well as continue to keep Israel in your prayers as they fight against unspeakable terror in the Middle East. I hope you'll consider giving to this important organization. If you want to know how, go to Huckabee.tv. We have links directly for you there. Keith Bilbrey is standing by to tell us what we have coming up next on the show. It's good, too. You're going to like it. Well, the suspense is over. Tim Gagno's work of art will be revealed after the break. And later, William Lee Golden and the Goldens have a masterpiece of their own. It's all ahead on Huckabee. TV and get your very own Made in the USA Huckabee mugs, t-shirts, and more.
And welcome back. Now, all night long, Tim Gangyo has been working on a new original masterpiece. It's been created live right here in the studio just for us. The big unveiling just moments away. But before we do that, I want to talk to Tim a little bit. I want you to give a big hand to the painter, author, speaker, and creator of the Illuminated Messiah Bible. This is it right here. And founder of the Gangyo Atelier. Is that right how you say it? Atelier. Atelier. <laughs> Two years of French in high school did nothing for me. <laughs> the Atelier Art Outreach Ministry, Tim Gangyo. Tim, great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. It has been amazing just watching you over working on this during the show. You started with a big black nothing, and we're going to see a finished product here in a moment. I'm excited. It's so much fun to paint and draw all the time. <sighs> yeah, but you do this. It's under so much pressure. You go to a church or maybe some civic group, and within the time of the meeting when you're there, you do this in front of their very eyes. I think it's just phenomenal to see Lots this. of practice. Yeah, lots of pressure. <laughs> the Illuminated Messiah Bible is a fascinating work that you have been a part of. What makes this Bible unique and different? That is a collection of 66 original messianic portraits, mm. Jesus from every book in the Bible. It collects uh, the main messianic theme in, from Genesis to Revelation, all the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. Mm -hmm and then their fulfillment in the New Testament in Jesus, our Messiah. And so all these beautiful paintings come together and they form individually, they're, they're a painting like we're looking at yeah, Exodus right Exodus. now. And if you look here, you can see in Deuteronomy, you see Moses parting the Red Sea, but yeah. right here, you see Jesus's toes, all of these paintings connect together and they form a 12 foot cross and when you look at that cross, you don't see Moses or Joshua. You see Jesus crucified on the cross. So all 66 books in the Bible point to Jesus. Uh, each book of the Bible, you have an artwork. How long did it take you to do this? It took me five years in the studio, just me and Jesus painting together, having a great time wow. and working on that. Five years. Yeah, this is like my painted devotional where I was trying to figure out what Messiah means and what it's about. And now people that read this Bible, they can go along that journey with me and discover Jesus, our Messiah. Describe when, when you talk about an art ministry, what does that mean and what do you do? Well, for me, it's like, I look at it this way. You know, it used to be if you want to see the greatest works of art in the world, you went to church. Yeah. And for the first 1,500 years of church history, the primary tool that we used to engage, interact, and influence culture were the visual arts, drawings, mm. paintings, architecture, sculpture, frescoes. Think of the Sistine Chapel. People would cross the English Channel and walk all the way across Europe just to see Michelangelo's works. And I imagine today what... God could do in our churches today if the most beautiful art in your city, in your state, was in your church building, what mm. could God do with that? That's wow. my vision. I know that you've got a very special finishing touch to add to your painting this evening. Should we go over and take a look? Let's take Let's a do look it. and do it. All right, if you want to see more of the work of Timothy Gagneau, including his amazing illuminated Messiah Bible exhibit and to learn about how his art ministry, the Gagneau Atelier, no, how do you pronounce it? Atelier. Atelier. That's what I was going to say. How that can help your church, school, or veterans group, go to Huckabee.tv. All right, now to finish his painting, I want you to give a round of applause to Tim Gagneau.
Wow. Yeah, I'm glad I wasn't standing next to you when you were spitting fire. <laughs> Never play with fire, kids. Hey, you know what? I know you're, you're saying we've had a lot of go stuff going on, but we have another surprise. Because on behalf of the Patriot Art Foundation, Tim would like to gift this painting to private first class Jacob Williams and his family. So Jason, now that you and Meredith have a new home and a lot of bare walls, you guys can enjoy this beautiful original artwork as your very first housewarming gift. And you know, I think it's still warm. So a housewarming gift and it's warm. Give them all another round of applause. Wonderful. Thank you. Appreciate it, Governor. That was awesome. Thank you very much. All right, Keith. You know, this is a smoking show so far. And there's something very exciting still to come. Keith Bilbrey is just burning up to tell us what's next. Go oh, ahead. You know I am. What a nice dedication, Governor. Up next, Oak Ridge boy William Lee Golden is here with his family for a special performance. Don't you go away. week, Missouri Governor Mike Parson will be here, and a special performance from the Oak Ridge Boys. Well, that's right, Keith. If you love the Oak Ridge Boys, and who doesn't, don't miss next week's show. But right now, my next guest, well, he's been a member of the Oak Ridge Boys since 1965. His sons, Rusty and Chris, have worked together as the Golden since the 1980s, racking up hit songs, two Grammy-nominated albums, and working with icons like Larry Gatlin and the band Alabama. Recently, they all teamed up with the grandkids to form William Lee Golden and the Goldens. They've already released three albums and a number one single, Come and Dine, and they're out on tour. It's an honor to welcome William Lee, Chris, and Elizabeth Golden. Welcome, all of you. Thank you for coming. William Lee, you know, I find it just amazing. Oak Ridge Boys since 1965. That's a long time to be in a band. Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, it don't seem like long when you look back on it, but uh, then uh, look back again and you realize just how long it is. But uh, yeah, I was, uh, I grew up in South Alabama on a cotton and peanut farm. Hmm. My sister taught me how to play music when I was uh, seven and eight years old. She taught me to play rhythm guitar and sing harmonies. And uh, I'd say she did a pretty good job teaching well, you to sing harmonies. <laughs> it's worked out pretty well. Yeah, I've always needed someone to help me out, you know. So, <laughs> well, uh, now you've got your family, and this is what is exciting to me. Three generations of Goldens. Three generations, yeah. Uh, Chris and Rusty, my sons, and... Uh, Craig, he all, another one of my sons sang on these albums. Uh, he did a song, but Elizabeth played on there too, and she sings. And so Elizabeth, you grow up with a famous grandfather, watching him sing with the Oak Ridge Boys. Did you want to be a singer from the time you were little? It's always been a part of my blood. We've, you know, grown up playing piano and. He plays everything under the sun except for fiddle, which is why I picked it. Oh, for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, but music's always been a part of our, our home, and it's just an honor to continue to be a part of that legacy. And you just put out a new album yourself, yes. right? Yes. I went, or I went, Dad drove halfway to Chattanooga yesterday to pick him up. <laughs> so we've got him here. I got to hold him in my hands today, which was really, really special. Well, it's special to have you and your dad and your grandfather and other members of your family going to do some music for us before we get to the music. Uh, Chris, you know, I, I just think it's wonderful that you and your brothers are kind of taking up the family business because there are a lot of times when you have a famous relative, they don't want any part of what their family members do. You know, it's like, I don't want to do any of that because I see they're gone all the time. They're always on the road. How did you keep from having sort of that resentment that your dad was gone and he's out there singing, he's on the stage, 
And there you are. Well, he joined the Oaks when I was just a small child. So yes. it's something that was, you know, that we just grew up with. It wasn't anything different to that. You know, whenever they were a gospel group, I always thought they were as big as the Beatles, you know, back then. But all uh, true. But uh, because, you know, they had the cool suits and boots and, of course, you know, tro rode around on buses and played and they looked like they were having a whole lot of fun. It's like, well, man, you know, I'm, I'm kind of glad my dad wasn't a mechanic at that point because, you know, or a house builder. So it's like, hey, I think I can do this. You know, well, But I it was something that came easy yeah. for us because my dad got his start on his granddaddy Golden's radio mm. show, who his great his grandfather was a fiddle playing holiness preacher that had a radio show. Dad got his start on that show when he was young, and now it's kind of cool to see this this generation getting to go out and play and sing with their grandfather. So I, it's something that's, you know, just, just carrying it on. It's I think family it's just, business. It's wonderful, and we're so thrilled to have you guys all here. And uh, we're going to get ready to perform. Keith Bilbury is going to tell everyone where to find the music of the Goldens and also how to get tickets to see the Golden family live because they're going to be probably coming to a community near you. If you enjoyed this video, I hope you'll consider clicking the subscribe button below and the notification bell next to it so you don't miss any of our future videos when they go up online.